Hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and welcome to another edition of Startup Basics, brought to you by our friends at WSGR. That's Wilson Sonsini, the great law firm uh, that I've had a great partnership for many years with. And today on the program, we're going to talk about one of the most important things you'll ever do with your startup, which is name it. Now, naming a startup is incredibly hard, and most people do a terrible job at it. Why do most people do a terrible job at it? Well, there's so many people creating names of companies that just like creating the name of a band, you have to make sure that you're not going to bump into somebody. So there are legal issues like trademarks. There are confusion issues uh, like Apple Computer and then Apple the record label by the Beatles, uh, which led to many lawsuits and uh, Steve Jobs and the Beatles having to uh, make a lot of different agreements, Yoko Ono and Paul, uh, Paul McCartney and everything, very complicated story, and you can look it up later. What we'll do today is we'll just start with a very basic uh, concept, which is what should I name my startup? And the best way to start that is I'll tell you a story about we, uh, Weblogs, Inc., my, my second company. We were creating a lot of blogs, and so at the end when we sold to AOL, we had 96 different blogs. That means we had to do a naming exercise 96 times. It was incredibly difficult. And so we came up with a lot of different ways to do things. And we came up upon a couple of concepts. One of them was, do we want to be literal uh, or do we want to evoke something in people, right? Do we want to have them feel something, right? So a literal name is like tv.com, right? Or tvguide.com. The name explains what it is. Now, a name that evokes a feeling um, it would be something like Yahoo or Google, right? It doesn't actually mean something until it means something. So there's pros and cons. When you use something literal, well, you get the benefit of people know what you're doing. When you use something evocative and that maybe people don't actually know yet, well, you get something very unique, right? Like Google or Yahoo um, or eBay, eBay is one of those ones that's kind of in the middle because Bay kind of people understand a little bit. So there are things that exist between literal and just completely evocative and just trigger something in you. But let me give you one example. We wanted to create a video game blog. And so we wanted to make the game. We, we thought Joystick would be a great name for a video blog. Now, how did we come to that? Well, we just did a, an exercise where we asked everybody in the room to throw out any word that has to do with video games. And so they said Atari, they said first person shooter, they said 25 cents, coin operated, asteroids, just different things. And joystick came up, right? And so that was like, oh, joystick, right. That's like the device where you actually have the experience. Well, of course, joystick.com was not available. And so then after much thinking, somebody said, well, why don't we misspell it on purpose? And this is your first tip, which is it doesn't have to be spelled perfectly. You can make something unique by misspelling it. And so people have been doing this for a long time. We heard on this program um, that Flickr was because they couldn't get Flickr with an ER. So somebody, uh, Katarina, dropped the E and just made it Flickr with an R. And that actually wound up making it very unique. So with Joystick, we just added a Q at the end. And the rest is history. People understood what it is. Now, let me take another example. We had a blog about Apple computers. We called it the unofficial Apple weblog. Now that's a big literal mouthful. So we came up with another trick, and this is your second trick, which is an acronym that means something. So instead we came up with T-U-A-W. And I actually came up with that and said, hey, there's a four letter domain, because I had been obsessed with four letter domains. So we got TWA, and I never actually pronounced it TWA, but people started calling it TWA. And now it's famous as TWA. People go to Apple conventions and say, did you read it on TWA? That was never the intention. It was just an acronym, acronym T-U-A-W. Further, uh, the founders of Engadget, another blog we named, wanted to start a blog called Gadget. So they named it G-D-G-T. They took the vowels out. And again, short, memorable, punchy, uh, all of these things. Now. 
another thing to do when you're brainstorming is to use a dictionary or a thesaurus. My favorite is something called OneLook.com. And on OneLook, they have something called a reverse dictionary page. And what the reverse uh, dictionary does is it lets you describe a concept. I'm reading from the page here, OneLook.com. Describe a concept and get back a list of words and phrases related to that concept. So... This is exactly like the brainstorm session, except it's on crack. So here, I'm going to type in traveler, right? Let's say we're starting a travel blog. Uh, and the first thing it says is hike, traveler, walker, rider. Ooh, rider. I like that one. Let's bookmark that. Passenger, Marco Polo, pedestrian, polo, companion, footer, hustler, cosmonaut, fellow traveler, tallyman, wayfarer. Ooh, wayfarer, a tallyman. I like both of those, wayfarer and tallyman. So I'm going to open those up and look at the definitions. I've never even heard of those. Um, or I think I have. Anyway, one who keeps a total, a tally uh, of quantity or weight of goods produced or shipped and received. That's a fascinating word. A tallyman is great. I mean, it does have a gender issue, right? Um, and then uh, one look uh, came up with Wayfarer, a person who travels by walking, right? So these are great names. So we have Wayfarer. So if I was going to start a business and it was in travel, I might just drop the E from there and just go for Wayfarer, but spelled W-A-Y-F-A-R-R or something. And then I just tell everybody it's two R's. And this takes us to our next uh, tip, which is fake it until you make it. In the domain space, right, and I've been very focused on domains here, and, and we're going to get to apps and other things in a minute, but fake it till you make it means it's okay to have a but ugly domain when you start because, hey, when I'm an angel investor and I'm looking at your company, I, I don't want to hear that you bought a million-dollar domain and you didn't put it into the product yet. So if your product sucks and you put a million dollars into a domain, that, that might actually signal like maybe you're just a little loopy. Now, if you're rich... Fine. If you're Mark Cuban or, you know, and you buy a great domain name, great. You're Mark Cuban. You can afford it. It's just a rounding error. But for like uh, young startups, it's okay to fake it until you make it. A perfect example was Delicious, a bookmarking service that Yahoo bought 10 years ago. When they started, it was like D-E-L dot issues dot us. And that was the dot us domain name. And people couldn't find it. So they Googled it and it was the first listing after they got popular. So that's something you need to know. And that's another tip. It's okay if it's misspelled. Because at a certain point, Flickr with no E is going to come up first above Flickr with an E. So the misspelling at some point will win the Google search race. Now, what Delicious did was they grew. They got better and better. They proved out the model. And for a commercial internet service, 7 of 10, which fail, to actually make it into that group of 3 of 10 that succeed, well, then they were able to raise more money and buy the domain name. Um, and Box, I think, had the similar thing. Uh, and many times you see people using misspellings, .nets, .co's, whatever it is. And in truth, you know, having .com makes you look incredibly legitimate. But having a .net is not the end of the world. And a .co actually, I think, is better than a .net. I love the .co domain uh, namespace. So those are domains. And there are some ideas for how to, for you to brainstorm what your site will look like. Now, uh, prefixes and suffixes are also a great way uh, to do things. So when we launched the launch ticker, which was um, a, a research service by the team at launch, well, we just added the word ticker to it. And so ticker or report or reporter or daily or news, any of those can come after a word. So let's say you wanted to create a site that was about wireless news or Bitcoin news. Well, Bitcoin reporter, or you put the word the in front of it, the Bitcoin reporter, or the Bitcoin report. Now, all these variations, you're probably going to find one that works. And if you want a hint for how to do this, and this is another tip, look at how they used to name newspapers. Because newspapers, another great startup business from 100 years ago, they had to go through this. So they did the New York Observer, the New York Times, the New York Weekly, Daily, New York Post, New York Press. Time Out New York, right? So there's all different ways. And Time Out New York's a great one, right? They put something in front of New York. And these are great ways. Voice, right? Village voice. Uh, voice you could put at the end of any uh, geographic location. So these are all great names. Now, here's one that I'm very proud of. It's called gadling.com. And the way I found gadling was I wanted to create a travel site. And so I started searching using one of these reverse dictionaries and some thesauruses. And I found the word gadling just by stumbling upon it. And the, the definition was a roving vagabond, one who roams, a man of humble condition, a fellow 
a low fellow, low born, originally comrade or companion in a good sense, um, but later used in reproach. A spike on a gauntlet, a gad. Uh, who knows what those last couple things are? But anyway, I fell in love with the word gadling. And I go to buy the domain name and it's available. Nobody had ever thought about it. Now this was 10 years ago, so most domains are gonna be taken. But you could do get gadling, go gadling, and this is another great tip. You put a little word before it until you can buy it. Then you have to negotiate with the domain squatter. So let me give you a couple of tips around that. Buy up five different, six different ways to say something. Then when you negotiate with somebody who owns gadling.com, let's say I didn't own it at the time, I can say, dear Mr. Uh, domain squatter, I really uh, love the name Gadling, and it was so prescient of you to register it. I'm sure you love the name as well. I am a humble startup founder trying to build something awesome in the world, and I would love, if you're amenable to it, to purchase your domain name. See how I'm being like a little bit of like, uh, you know, humble and nice. Uh, everything I'm not. No, just kidding. But I'm being humble and nice, and I'm trying to, you know, butter the person up a little bit, play it down a little bit, and. Then when you talk to me, say, I already own Get Gadling and Go Gadling uh, or The Gadling or Gadling Report or Gadling Daily. So I don't actually really need it, but I would love to have it. Can we talk? And that's just a great way to start the conversation out because you know that you've got all those things. Now, with Inside.com, which is my latest startup, I loved that domain for over 10 years. And so did a lot of my friends. It had been used and abused, and then it got sold to a domain squatter. And a good friend of mine, Rafat Ali, who has a company called Skift.com, what a great name, a Skift, right, for a travel site. Hey, we keep, uh, we keep going on this travel theme. Uh, Skift, what a great name, right? That's a Skift is like something you travel on. Great. So, and it's memorable, and people don't use it that often. So he had bought Inside.com, and he had wound up never using it, and I wound up buying it from the person he sold his last company to. But oh my God, when I tell people that I'm the CEO of Inside.com, they say to me, how did you get that domain? Oh, that's a great brand. And the reason I coveted that brand so much, like the domain name about.com, if you put a topic on it in the URL, it speaks volumes, Inside.com, slash Game of Thrones, inside.com slash Bitcoin, inside.com slash Brooklyn, inside Brooklyn, right? So I've got the naming convention built into the domain structure. That's like a high level Kung Fu stuff that took me 20 years to get to. But if you can start to have your domain structure work for you, boy, does that work great. Okay, so we've gone through a couple of things here. Um, let's talk about apps. Apps have created a whole new reset on branding. Because if somebody actually had a blog called Gadling uh, and they weren't updating it that frequently or it's kind of sitting out there, it's quite possible somebody would create an app called Gadling and not feel bad about it. And then it would be up to the person with the blog to go to them and say, hey, that's my trademark. And that's why you need to file a trademark on your domain name and on the name of your company. So that when people step on you in another medium, you have a little bit of protection. So every time a new medium comes out, whether it's a new domain space like .co or apps, it gives people this next chance to uh, actually use your brand again, like Apple Computer did to Apple Records. And the way trademarks work is, you basically can trademark something in your vertical or in a number of verticals, but if you're not really active in those verticals, you really can't have it everywhere. And if the more generic of a name you use, the more open you are to other people being able to use it. Now, this is not legal advice, but these are just general rules. If you use something like the word inside.com as the name of your site, you really don't have the ability to go to somebody who has inside the NBA on TNT or inside baseball as a podcast or something and tell them you have to stop using it just because I got the domain name inside.com. But whoever has the best domain name and the best SEO will ultimately win. So when people tell me, oh, Jason, somebody created inside bitcoin.com, I'm not particularly worried because I have the best domain name. I win ultimately in the SEO ra um, races and in people's minds. And about.com had that same thing happen. People would register 100 domain names about this, about chocolate, about Tesla, about sushi. And the folks at about.com, sometimes they would take action, I'm sure, but they just could sleep well knowing that they had the best domain name in the world and they didn't actually have to worry about it. Now, there is something happening, interestingly, uh, in the app stores. People will build an app called Bitcoin. 
and it will suck because they're the first people to put out an app called Bitcoin. And then they forget about it. And they own the word Bitcoin in the app store. Now you have to come in and say Bitcoin times or Bitcoin whatever, the Bitcoin app, whatever it is. Well, you can go find that person and ask them to take over their namespace in the app store, pay them a little cash, essentially buy the app from them, but you're really buying the placeholder in the app store. Now, let's get to Twitter handles. Twitter handles are particularly difficult because everybody bought up all the premium ones and they or they're using them. I own a ton of premium uh, Twitter handles. I have at Jason, I've got, uh, you know, at uh, Santa Monica, I've got at questions, I've got at answers, I've got all these great handles. I'm not giving them away. Don't email me and ask for it. However, I put them to use and I have at video games, all these great ones, just because I happen to be there early. But then people don't use them. So Twitter actually has a process, you can go look on their site for asking them to release them. Very difficult thing to do. You're probably not gonna get the handle you want. So what you wanna do in that case is just put a go or a get uh, in front of it, or you can put D-O-T-C-O-M at the end. It's kind of ghetto, but it works. So there's a lot of options on how to handle the Twitter space. Now with the Twitter, Twitter namespace, you also have to keep in mind that it's illegal, or I shouldn't say illegal, the police aren't coming. It's against the terms of service to buy and sell Twitter handles. Yet it happens all the time. If you try to buy one, you have to be discreet about doing it. So the way you do it, I've heard, is you say to somebody, hey, you have this great Twitter handle at inside.com or at cars. I would like to buy at cars from you. Um, however, I can't buy from you, so I'd like to hire you as a consultant to teach me how to do social media for $1,000. And as part of that, I would love it if you gifted me at cars. And the person says, I get it, wink, boom. What really Twitter should do is just allow an open marketplace for it. So um, pairing words together is fine. And coming up with fake names, I think is dangerous. So I would rather see you use something super clean, but not have a great domain extension for now, than come up with a wacky name that nobody can pronounce. And this is one of my final tips. If the person cannot say the name to another person over a bad cell phone connection and have them be able to pull it up on their computer or phone, you have failed. So in the original version of Delicious, people would have just given up trying to say it over the phone. It's D-E-L dot I-O-U as a dot U. I'd be like, come on, stop. With Flickr, you could say it's Flickr without an E dot com. And the person would say, okay, so F-L-I-C-K-R dot com. You sure that's what it is? And you say, yes, I'm sure. It would pass the over a bad cell phone connection test for the other person to type it in. And you want people to type it in without having to repeat themselves. That's where length is sort of a problem and misspelling stuff on purpose can work against you. So it's one thing to misspell something, you know, in a minor way that you can explain quickly, but you don't want to have like 17 misspellings. And it's okay to like double a word, double a letter or take a letter out. Those are okay solutions too. But you don't have to panic about it. What you really want is a name that is beautiful and simple and clean. You don't want to have one of these weird names where, and, and I see this actually in a lot of non-US companies. So I'll see companies from you know, Germany or Israel or Taiwan, and they are looking at the names in the US and they can't get the domain name. So they keep trying and say, whatever domain name I can get .com is what it's going to be, which is absolutely ensures your, your name of your company will suck. Name the company and the domain name should approximate that. It doesn't actually have to fit it. So I had this um, talk a couple of times in my career. Uber Taxi was the original name of Uber. And when I first heard that, I was like, drop the taxi because it's not actually a taxi. And they were able to fake it until they make it. And now everybody knows it just as Uber. Uh, Pando Daily came out and they had Daily there. And they, I guess they didn't have Pando.com. They operated like that for a year or two. And then Sarah Lacey was able to get Pando.com. And now they call themselves simply Pando.com. And so these are great ways to wait it out uh, and figure out when it's your turn. Another possibility is to look at how other people are branding and adapt it. So Zendesk, an amazing company. They put Zen in front of a very basic word. So it evokes something in you. Oh, Zen, calm, peaceful, great. So you can put Zen in front of payroll and there's a Zen payroll now. You can put Zen in front of anything and you know zen payments i'm sure there's a zen payments and so what you gain in that is the credibility that the original brand 
uh, created. So you get this like great, oh, Zendesk is known as being awesome and loving, great. But what you lose by putting drop in front of everything, drop cam did okay, but I will always associate drop cam, which I love as a great startup with Dropbox. I think drop cam is part of Dropbox. And then other people will take the TechCrunch name and do something crunch. Uh, as a matter of fact, I saw card munch or card crunch. I can't remember. But people will do that as well. If you do that and you leverage somebody else's name like that, they will probably hate you and resent you and they may sue you. So you have to be careful there. So that's a toss up. You have to really start to think about that. Now, some words you can really own um, and build a lot of brands around. So we did this with a word called squad at Weblogs Inc. We love the idea of teams of people blogging. So that was where Brian Alvey came up with this idea was we were talking and we're wrapping out and we're doing our whiteboard session. And I was like, okay, well, it's a team of TV bloggers. So it would be like TV heads or TV team or team TV. And he's like, yeah, it's like a, what's another word for team? And we type it in, he's squad. And I was like, TV squad. Oh, that rolls right off of the tongue, right? And that's when you know you've got it, when you say it out loud a number of times. And that's why this is a group participation um, type of effort when you're naming a company. Don't beat any ideas down, let them all come out, get them all on the whiteboard, and then you start consolidating them down. Uh, you have to go with your gut at the end of the day when you name your company. If it's personal, that's great. Uh, people love that. And if it's clever, people love that. So clever, Pinterest. It's just so clever, isn't it? You're pinning your interest, Pinterest. So somewhere somebody was putting words together and then trying to combine them and make a compound word. So compound wording, another great option. Um, and take your time and don't be a slave to what's available in the dot-com dot -com domain space 25 years later. You're not gonna win that. Free yourself, come up with a name that you love, do a little background, make sure you're not stepping on anybody's toes. Take a couple of chances, you can always change the name later. But put the work in, come up with a lot of options, say them out loud, and you're gonna do just fine. I guess that's it. That's as much as I can tell you about naming your company in 15 minutes. So let me stop for a minute and let you know that we're doing a whole bunch of these, how to raise money, how to hire people, how to fire people. All these hard, hard things that I hear from the 75 companies I've invested in. Yeah, I've invested in a lot of companies. And I always tell CEOs of my companies, my companies, of their companies, of the companies I'm lucky enough to invest in, I tell them, call me with your hard issues. You know what? They call me. And I have these discussions over and over again with founders. So in this series, the Startup Basics series, brought to you by our friends at Wilson Sonsini. Again, thank you so much for sponsoring this, Wilson Sonsini. It's been a great pleasure to work with you guys over the years. This is uh, what we're going to do here. And so there's a lot more where these came from. And so click on some of these links and you'll see more. And of course, you can always reach me on Twitter. I'm at Jason or Jason at inside.com. See you later.